We are good then, right? And I just wanted to check to make sure I can come online. Nobody has come on. They told me they were here. I just like to see it. Damn, you're cutting out. Hold on. Hold on a minute. Okay, Jack, Amherst Media is in the house. Okay. So you are good to go. All right. Um, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of September 14th, 2021. My name is Jack Jumsek and as the chair of the planning board, I'm uh, calling this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this planning board meeting including public hearings will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar, listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of this public will be permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive rec record of proceedings as soon as possible at the meeting, uh, on, on, after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call when I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And myself, of course. So board members, technical issues arise. We may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem, and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during this general public comment period and reserve comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting, use a telephone. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify, identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be dis disconnected from the meeting. So uh, the first item is the August 18th, 2020, one uh, minutes and I don't know if there's any discussion or any motions for approval amongst the board and oh, I got to get my uh, participants here. Um, okay, uh, Chris. So Janet McGowan sent in some um, edits and Pam has them. They're in red on the document that Pam will show you. They're on page six, and I think page eight of the um, of the draft minutes. So I don't know if if Janet wants to tell you about those comments. Um, they they kind of speak for themselves. They're just sort of extra detail. Um, you know, the one Nate had said that um, we were talking about like the frontage on the mixed use buildings. And he was saying that if the spaces were too shallow, restaurants need deeper spaces. So I just thought that was an inter interesting fact. And so I pretty much just put in like facts. And then um, I did go back and look at some of the comments I made um, in the video. And so I just, I can't really, I actually am having trouble seeing this because it's so small. You, but you, use, you can go up top and and yeah, view options. It, let me try that one yeah okay, go to view okay. options and then uh zoom this ratio is, this is reader digest big now for me Thank i'm you. using 150 percent. so uh, <laughs> so i just i just was adding some more detail about mixed-use buildings um 
you know, the, the high costs of rental new buildings, you know, and how that wouldn't, you know, there's such a demand in a market that I didn't think the mix adding increasing mixed use would make it worse. And then the study, the spending, um, how much money goes out of our town to local towns. And I thought, you know, so I just put those in because I thought they were helpful facts, you know, someone maybe looking could find that useful later. So that's it. And and Janet, just to clarify, you the you stated this, these things. Yeah, I, I went back. These are not like exacto quotes, but that is the, the gist of it. I went back and listened. So okay. All right. Uh, anyone want to make a motion to approve the minutes with the changes proposed by Janet? Uh, Tom? So moved. Okay, we got a a second. I'll second. Okay, Janet. Uh, any further discussion on these minutes? All right, um, I see none. So let's do a roll call for approval of the minutes as modified. Um, Maria? Approve. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I am an aye as well. So that's seven zero to approve the minutes as modified. All right, now we have um, opportunity for public comment. And I see a few folks uh, present in the, as, in, as attendees. And uh, Susanna Mosprat, state your name and address, please. And then we have Pam Rooney and then Janet Keller. Hi, Susanna. Uh, Susanna Muspratt, 38 North Prospect Street in Amherst. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the apartments amendment. Um, I was at the CRC meeting this afternoon and they had a long discussion and I think have left some notes for you all to think about tonight, but it's not on your agenda. So I hope I can make this comment. I just want to encourage you to be thinking about the downtown BL districts. There was a lot of discussion about the desirability of having retail and commercial space on the ground floor in the BG and how to prevent that area from going heavily into apartments. And I think the same concerns need to be considered with regard to those two downtown BL districts. For whatever reason, Maureen's analysis did not look at those two districts. It's probably because the modifications to the um, dimensional table for those districts are still under active discussion. But um, whatever ends up happening there, there's really now, if the cap on apartments is lifted, there's no disincentive for that, those two areas to become nothing but apartments. And I want you to be thinking about whether you want that to be what happens to that part of downtown. I think we still wanna have mixed use there so that there are some spaces for smaller businesses and services that residents are going to need, particularly if they live downtown and don't have cars. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, next is Pam Rooney. State your name and address, Pam. Pam Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, I would would second what uh, Ms. Muspratt just said. Uh, currently, those BLs are very active commercial, and I think lifting the cap of 24 units per building um, is an in, is an incentive for um, development of those of those two BLs, especially along the, uh, the Kendrick Park and um, <clears throat> I'll call it the Henyon Block. My real comment tonight, though, is. Um, my disappointment with the, the 
tracking and processing of the parking bylaw. This has gone back and forth several times. And um, when I, I kept checking the packet for tonight's meeting, what were you talking about? And it was the old parking bylaw version that was discussed early on before the CRC got its hands on it. And then before the, the planning staff put their, their to it as well. So it feels like we are out of order in that you aren't really seeing this proposed amendment uh, until you know a day or an evening before your meeting. And certainly the public has not had to. I finally saw your additional uh, document number one which shows the version that you've been talking about for, for um, I think with, this, with the CRC. Um, I, I would just ask that, that, that this um, process start over, that it get re-publicized, re-noticed, and that we start with the actual document that you are talking about in everyone's hands before the meeting begins. And I, and I understand that town council thinks that's just a technicality and just a change of a slight change of scope. I think the version that you're talking about tonight is very different and a different approach to things. So um, I'm just going to lodge my complaint and listen to you talk about it anyway, and uh, probably get ignored. But uh, that's what I really wanted to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. We have Janet and then Dorothy Pam. Janet Keller and then Dorothy Pam. Janet, um, state your name and address, please. Janet, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, Janet Keller, 120 Pulpit Hill Road. Um, I would also like to speak to quickly to two things. Um, the first is uh, lifting the cap on the apartments and uh, a concern that I have uh, from that others have pointed out that in lifting those it's going to be a huge incentive and um, the village the impact on the village centers each of those has a very distinct character the three village centers and the impacts would be different in each of them, but it would tend to have the uh, give the incentive to the apartments and um, to the detriment of the small businesses there, which are essential to um, people's daily lives. Um, and you know, we've got some good uh, businesses, uh, small businesses in uh, North Amherst. Um, the second is I would like to add my voice um, and respectfully ask you that since we haven't been able to access the materials for the parking that you um, reschedule so that people can participate in um, a <clears throat> parking um, uh, proposal that will have a profound effect on people's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Dorothy Pam, please. Okay, okay. Dorothy, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, I agree, I did, I had looked and looked, did not see a, a, this meeting. And um, I'm coming from a day in which I didn't have a minute, teaching all day, then CRC meeting, and then answering two emails and showing up here. Um, so I don't even know what, how the parking thing has changed since the last time I tuned in. I do know that at CRC, we thought that we did not want to lift the cap on apartment building in the BG because we wanted to really encourage uh, mixed use and commercial uses. Uh, there was some talk of apartment houses at the back of the um, places, but I began to worry, is where are people going to put their cars? Right now, Lincoln Avenue, the people are, are just up in arms. They cannot leave their driveways. They're feeling it unsafe. There are cars parked over lawns all over the place. 
just way more cars than I think there were before COVID. So um, UMass says no more parking places for rent. Students are on waiting lists. People are panicking. So all those new people coming in to um, rent in the new apartments don't have a place to park because it's in a no parking district. I, I just think we're, we're heading towards a really uh, bad situation. Um, when the planning board first presented many of its plans for the downtown, it talked about some really good ideas of shared parking uh, to reduce the impact and costs on, on some of the builders, builders and parking in back. Convenient, yet not messing up the streetscape. Um, so I really like parking. We need parking. People have cars. The students seem to have, as I say, more than ever. So the idea that students didn't need cars has not been proved to be true, okay? They think they need them and they have brought them back with a vengeance. Um, so I guess I would join with the other speakers to say that because of the confusion about what was posted and the un unusual day and uh, whatever, that I, I guess I hope that we can put off, that you can that you can put off this discussion uh, to another day. It's It's been, we, we, I know we're all trying to work and a big rush, but um, sometimes it gets to be just too much, too soon, too fast. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dorothy. All right, um, so, I mean, I have to admit, I was not able to grab the material that was emailed today. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna rely on what is presented by the planning staff, um, but I have some sentiments that I, that was, was a lot late breaking, you know, changes on the parking. Uh, uh, Chris, do you wanna to speak to that? I wanna to apologize to the planning board for not including um, the latest version of the zoning amendment in your packets. It was an oversight um, by me. I, um, on Friday when we were putting the packet together, I did send out the latest version to you yesterday um, during the day. So you would have had, you know, 24 hours to look at it. I think it's worthwhile to at least um, hear a presentation about it tonight. And so you understand what is being discussed and then you can decide for yourselves whether you feel <clears throat> that you wanna you know, take action on it tonight. Um, I think in any event that it's probably likely that you're gonna to have to have one more meeting in September um, in addition to the 29th. So I'm going to make a plea about that later on, but um, I'd like to encourage you to hear the presentation about the new parking amendment tonight. And then, as I said, you can decide what to do about it. But I do apologize for um, not having gotten the correct information into the packet. So uh, my understanding is that we, we definitely would hear it, but would we um, be, you know, in the majority of continuing the, the deliberation on this because of the, the new material? Uh, Janet? Um, I've already raised this concern. Um, I think I was the one who I couldn't on Monday, I couldn't figure out what amendment we were looking at because the packet and the um, the notice of the meeting was talking about the original zoning amendment. And so, you know, late yesterday, we got the um, August, fifth, I can't remember the right dates, um, August 24th version. And then sometime today, we have a new version that's dated September 14th. And so um, I would see some use in going through that amend, you know, I don't know, whatever we're on. Um, and then maybe talking about, I think I have an amendment and then um, Doug has one. I also think that the, we didn't really notify the public in the way that we need to, to, to say what we're discussing. And I, so I, I have two concerns, like the notice wasn't proper. We didn't get, they didn't have a chance to look at it, but I don't think we've actually had a look, chance to look at things and digest them. I know most of us have jobs and, you know, this is, legislative language and it has a lot of nuance to it. So I would I would not feel comfortable voting on this or even discussing it in depth. I was kind of, you know, I don't I don't have a paid job, but I, I've spent hours this afternoon going over this. And it, you know, as an attorney, that is the beginning of my process. And I'm very nervous about not looking at something a second time or or considering how the language works. I do appreciate Janet and Doug providing detailed comments. I, I certainly wasn't able uh, to, you know, uh, the schedule I had 
Um, and I just, or uh, Chris. I wanted to speak to the issue of um, what the public hearing notice says versus what ends up at the town council. Um, what's on your agenda is um, verbatim uh, what the public hearing notice said for the July 21st public hearing. Um, Rob Mora and I have spoken with Joel Bard, our town attorney from KP Law, and he has assured us that um, the zoning amendments may change over time. They may continue to evolve until the town council actually um, takes its vote. And so the advertisement here is, uh, you know, what we originally started out with, which was what the public hearing um, was held on. And we do acknowledge that the zoning amendment has changed, but I do not see um, any issue with uh, not talking about it because the uh, agenda doesn't exactly track what is currently being proposed. Again, Rob and I have spoken with the town council about this and we feel comfortable with the way things are proceeding. I understand that you may not want to vote on this tonight and that's perfectly reasonable, but um, the notice I think has been done properly. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely in agreement with you on that, Chris. Uh, just a couple other things that came up. <clears throat> are, are, is the BL uh, apartment bylaw thing that the CRC discussed, is that gonna come up later? Um, in your CRC report? I will report on that in the CRC yeah. report, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And then one other fact checking, is it true that the UMass parking is at maximum capacity? Can anybody confirm? Because I had no idea that it was that, in that situation. Chris? I've heard that from at least two sources, so I believe it's true. Okay, all right, interesting. Um, so with regard to the next item, uh, we'll go into uh, the uh, zoning amendment uh, that we're going to be reviewing. It's a zoning bylaw, Article 7, parking and access regulation, discussion and vote on recommendation to count, town council to see if the town will vote to amend Article 7, parking and access uh, regulation by amending Section 7.000 to separate the residential uses into two categories one of which would require two parking places per dwelling unit, one family detached dwellings, uh, comma, two family detached dwellings, and comma, townhouses and subdivided, uh, subdividable uh, converted dwellings. And, and one of which would require adequate parking for apartments, mixed use buildings and accessory dwelling units, and to provide criteria for the permit granting authority to determine what would be considered adequate parking. So we have an updated presentation by Ms. Maureen. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Jack. Uh, thanks for uh, having me uh, tonight. <laughs> uh, before I get into the proposed language, I just wanted to uh, say that you, you know the planning department is listening to <laughs> members of the public, the planning board, the CRC, the town council, et cetera, about all these zoning amendment uh, proposals. Uh, but, and um, I'll, I'm here to speak about the revised uh, parking proposal. Um, I did some deep dive research in parking um, and you know, I, I think that, you know, Amherst, um, you know, is is not Hartford, uh, Connecticut. It's it's not uh, Minneapolis, uh, uh, Minnesota, where there are um, parking regulations that say you don't need to provide it um, uh, for multiple uses. Um, those are cities that have, um, you know, rapid uh, transit and, and the like. And so we have modified our proposal um, to uh, still require that two parking spaces be provided for all dwelling units um, and that we want to provide an opportunity and flexibility for applicants if they so choose to uh, um, request a alternative ratio. Um, so um, firstly, I, or, or I'd like to just to say now, well, you know, parking space requirements are generally 
uh, based on uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineering um, Parking Generation Handbooks. Um, and so parking space requirements, so th those handbooks, which come out you know, every couple of years, um, they're a snapshot of America. Um, and so it's not of a particular city or town or demographics. Uh, so those uh, parking space requirements from the ITA, uh, ITE handbook are based on unit size, uh, bedroom counts, square footage, uh, sometimes. Uh, and so those uh, are sort of, um, you know, uh, yeah, um, factors that, that are considered. Other factors um, are sometimes uh, demographic factors such as age and income of tenants. But the um, ITAE handbook was always intended to be used in conjunction with information about local conditions. Uh, so um, so uh, generic standards, you know, sometimes don't grasp what are the local needs. Um, because again, the ITE handbook is a, sort of a generic snapshot of what our parking needs across the country and and probably uh, around the world. I'm sure the ITE handbook is international. Um, so one way to improve on um, these sort of generic parking requirements is to allow flexibility uh, based on certain uh, considerations such as locational factors. And that's what this proposal really gets into. Um, um, and I'll, I don't need to go through the, the list now, um, I will once we get to the actual proposal. But the intention of the proposed language is to handle uh, parking space requirements for um, now is for all dwelling units, um, including apartments, but all, all dwelling units, um, because, um, uh, you know, we heard from multiple uh, members of, of this board and uh, in the CRC of, you know, why aren't you looking at, you know, uh, duplexes or converted dwellings or, you know, or townhouses. So, you know, we can, this, this proposal does, does look at them all. And the rationale behind this proposed language under seven point four zeros is that it sets forth the parking space requirements and specific criteria required for considering uh, parking space uh, alternative uh, ratio proposed um, in that same section. So we have that subsection um, gets into parking requirements for residential uses and then continues on to other uses. Um, so we wanted to have that criteria specified there opposed to having to jump to the last subsection 7.91 to ask for a waiver request. Um, you know, one thing about section 7.91 is that it doesn't provide a complete criteria for evaluation of uh, parking modifications or waiver requests. And, you know, after speaking with multiple developers about this, it's often seen as deterrence and a gamble, like a variance request for potential developers. So, you know, uh, sometimes here we, we see the sort of the same developers make their proposals to the ZBA, the planning board, but there are other developers that are regional or national or international. They're just actually just thumbing through different zoning bylaws uh, in different regions and cities. And sometimes I get those phone calls of, you know, just uh, someone from a different uh, region of the country that it wants to hear, you know, what what does the zoning bylaw has to say about, you know, this section, that section, and all this. And to them, when they see that there needs to be this added waiver request or modification, it, it that's sort of, I don't want to say it's a red flag, but it, it adds this sort of layer of um, unpredictable Un, um, unpredictable outcomes. And so the proposal, again, is in the same section um, that gets into parking space requirements, and it specifies the specific uh, uh, criteria that the board may, um, you know, want to um, consider and have the, and, um, and, and it gives guidance for the developer uh, for that particular application to know, oh, okay, this is the criteria this is what I need to uh, provide evidence and submit to this board for their consideration. Again, it would be up to the permit granting authorities discretion to hear that evidence and um, make their, you know, their consideration and vote as a, as a board or um, at hand. And so with this as a framework, um, let me jump to the, um, the proposal itself. So um, one second. So let me. 
Can folks see this? Yes. Okay, so I will say um, the September 1st zoning bylaw uh, language is very similar to this, it, uh, which is dated September 14th. Um, and um, a planning board member had reached out uh, with some um, comments. And so the planning department felt, oh, we can, we can tweak this a little more. Um, and uh, perhaps we should have just held off and, and pitched and discussed them at tonight's meeting. Um, but so um, the proposal, I'll just get into what is new as of the end of August. Um, so um, so uh, let's see here. So in this first uh, paragraph, which is the beginning of section 7.0, which is about general requirements for parking, um, we wanted to get rid of this mention of uh, um, this last line of the paragraph, which is, you know, the, you know, the permit granting. I, I don't hear you, Maureen. I lost Maureen. Me too. Yeah. Okay. We can't hear you, Maureen. Well, there you are. You're back. Yeah. Yeah. So we didn't hear the last few sentences, Maureen. That's okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, that's fine. So the last sentence of this paragraph gets into, uh, you know, parking spaces shall be provided um, in at least the following minimum amounts. We actually wanted to modify that a little bit um, to get rid of where it says minimum because the proposal as revised is to still require two parking spaces for each dwelling unit. And so that is saying that is both representing the minimum and the maximum requirement for parking spaces. But uh, it continues to say, um, you know, that shall be provided unless the permit granting authority determines that an um, alternative ratio ensuring, ensuring adequate parking for the proposed use will be provided. Um, the special uh, the permit granting authority shall approve a parking management plan and determine the adequate number number of off street parking spaces based on specific criteria. Um, and that um, is listed here. And I could go to a clean copy if that's easier. Um, so that criteria is uh, bedroom I, count. I, I'd, I'd flip it over to a clean. Okay, sure, no problem. Copy. For this for this section, you could. Okay, so, so, whoops. So okay, so again, two spaces required for each dwelling unit. But you know, if the applicant wants to propose an alternative ratio. They can, um, if the board, you know, finds it adequate. And so, uh, what I'm, I'm about to get into is the specific factors uh, that the the permit granting authority would require that the applicant submit as evidence for their consideration. Um, so, bedroom count, uh, traffic impact, as identified in the traffic reports. This was a, a reworked uh, language today. Uh, parking utilization is documented through surveys of public or, or private on or off street parking with eight within 800 feet of the proposed use. Uh, peak parking needs generated by on site uh, uses, proximity to downtown, public transit, public parking, uh, availability of alternative modes of transportation, uh, tenant lease restrictions relative to, relative to parking, and um, shared or leased parking. Um, and this is not limited to this list. You know, if the permit granting authority has other criteria that they think is of interest, um, the permit granting authority has the discretion to add other factors. And so that would be part of that public hearing process. Um, and could it, yep. Could, Mark, I'm sorry, Maureen. Um, Jack, I, I'm not sure why we left the corrected draft because that's oh, I'm just think, just for this section here um, yeah i think i think it's easier in a way because there's been edits to the edits and so and some of them are quite significant so i i find that easier to see the changes than than to just look at it as text 
am I alone in this? Because I, like, I, I think if I was the person who, who um, was trying to follow this, I, as, as a person who is myself, but also a member of the public, it would be easier to see what's been changed since the last change, you know, um, which I guess I'm not even sure they ever got. So, but this is, this is helpful to me. Okay, we can leave this one. That's, yeah. that's fine. Sure. Yeah. So the, the, the three changes that were uh, prov provided in this version of the proposal is um, the criteria. So the first one, traffic Im impact, um, that's the criteria. So, uh, you know, um, the permit granting authority would want to know what, what is the traffic happening to the adjacent streets or that, you know, block that um, within the vicinity of the proposed uh, development. And the product is the traffic report. Um, but the analysis is looking at the traffic impact. And so that was uh, a good suggestion uh, by a planning board member to sort of um, clarify that. Um, and then the other one was parking utilization as documented through surveys of public or private on or off street parking with 800 feet of the proposed use. Um, and this is just sort of tinkering with the wording a little bit. Um, and so right now, if you're wondering, well, why 800 feet? Uh, so in the zoning bylaw, uh, current uh, as is, um, uh, development may propose on site parking or um, provide parking um, with a, within 800 feet of the proposed development. Um, and so that's why that, that language is here. And so, um, you know, a parking utilization study um, would be looking at, again, uh, would be going out, um, there would be a, um, you know, a, a tr there would be a parking consultant that would go out and at different times of, you know, uh, you know, the morning, midday, at night, and um, probably for a couple days or dates that they would go out and record what is what is the real parking situation in real time and seeing, you know, looking at, um, and they probably would, they would be doing that uh, with, a, with 800 feet of that proposed use. And, um, and so that would be helpful in determining, are there actually available parking spaces either on street or off street? Um, and what would that study show? And what would that evidence show to help support, you know, some applicants proposal? Um, the next revision is peak parking needs generated by on street uses. Um, and so that speaks to, you know, if, if are there multiple uses um, uh, on a property, if there's, let's just pretend there's a coffee, sh there's a mixed use building with a eye doctor on the first floor and all residential above, you know, is the, um, you know, perhaps uh, a study at looking at the different hours of and needs of those two different uses, do they complement each other in, in a way that could, you know, provide um, or, or have a consideration of um, providing shared or leased parking between the two uses. Um, and so um, that would then trigger um, this section, which is shared or leased parking as, as regulated in accordance with section 7.2. And so um, I don't know if you saw this before, but we just tweaked uh, this saying in addition to the amount of parking spaces provided for each dwelling unit shall satisfy the provisions of section 10.38 and 11.24 as applicable. Um, and if we scroll down to waivers, um, and so this under 7.91, which is uh, the specific section that currently uh, a permit granting authority would, would be um, reviewing a parking reduction or modification request um, for the amount of parking spaces. Um, here, we're saying, you know, uh, if you want a, a, you want the board to consider alternative ratio, you, you'll have to do that under um, 7.40s uh, for dwelling units. Um, but for the other uses specified um, in, in these in these sections here listed, uh, they would still have to um, go through 
um, this requirement, um, largely because we're not looking at other uses and, um, and that I think might be a whole other can of worms of, of looking at, you know, industrial and office uses and, and sort of things like churches and those sorts of things. So that would take considerable more time. Um, and so I think I captured everything. Let me scroll up. Yep. And again, uh, this proposal uh, clarifies that um, that that the um, parking space requirements now and with this proposal um, do, do not address uh, the municipal parking district. Thank you, Maureen. Um, yeah, Chris has her hand raised. Okay, Chris. I just wanted to reiterate what Maureen just said. This section that's. Can't hear you. Oh, no. I keep getting this little thing that's saying my internet is body. Is anybody else getting that? No, I can't see anyone's video. Except wow. For Bob. No. Oh, wait, everyone's back. Everyone's back? Okay. I just wanted to reiterate what Maureen just said, which is that the first section that we're changing, this seven and four zeros, deals with residential uh, parking. And now 7.91 deals with everything else, everything that's not residential, just to make that perfectly clear, because I think that was um, unclear previously to me as, as well as others. So thank you. Okay. Chris, can you say that one more time? Yeah. Yeah, this section that we're changing here that is highlighted that Maureen just went through, um, that all has to do with residential parking. And that's why um, it includes language that talks about modifying the requirement. This section here, section 7.91, with these numbers here that are highlighted, those numbers all refer to non-residential uses or uses that don't uh, have dwelling units, probably things like hotels and things like that, but they're not the dwelling unit uh, residential types of uses. So I just wanted to make that clear because otherwise it seems like we have redundant um, uh, language in here. That's all. I actually don't understand it still. So you're saying that this part of the waiver doesn't apply to. Janet, would you like me to recognize you? Yes, yes, thank you. Janet, you have your hand up. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so you're saying that this section of the waiver will no, no longer apply to veterinary establishments, day nurseries, farm stands, open lots, office park, professional research park, light industrial districts, NEED, um, off street parking and all that stuff. So you're, you're pulling this waiver section away from those three sections that are in 7.1. Uh, just to clarify, uh, so good question. So the proposal is removing the waiver modification request under 7.91 for all dwelling units and putting it under 7.40.40. Um, and, and so that is captured in, in within that section. The waiver and modification requirement or um, opportunity um, for other uses such as um, frat houses, religious and educational uses, public assemblies, libraries, gyms, the list vet, vet offices, the list goes on. Those um, uses which are under uh, 7.001, the 7.002, the three and the four would still uh, 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 have to, uh, if that applicant uh, would like to request a modification or waiver of the parking space requirement, they would still have to go under 7.1, 7.91. So we're not re removing any sort of opportunity 
from anyone to ask for either a waiver request for these uh, different uses or asking for alternative uh, ratio um, of parking spaces uh, for the dwelling units. Yeah, I'm having trouble kind of seeing how 7.00 is residential. Just looking at 7.00. Um, um, so it's not very. So it's it's just listed. So oh, uh, I'm, I'm looking at. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at an old copy. All right. Um, okay. I'm gonna close this copy I'm looking at. <laughs> I have again. I did not get the 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 last um, email. I wasn't able to download it, so I'm sorry. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up. I just wanted to say everything under seven point zero zero zero, which is three zeros, is dwelling units. Everything else is not dwelling units. Okay, so all we're dealing with tonight and changing is dwelling units. We're not changing all of the other things, okay? Um, Andrew and then Doug. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Maureen. Um, yeah, quick question, which is just if, um, you know, I guess, do we have or, or will the park permit granting authority have a good record of how many waivers have been issued. Uh, and I'm just thinking of a situation where you have like four or five houses in a row, you know, somebody applies for a waiver, they get it. Two or three years later, someone else applies for a waiver, they get it, you know, two years after that. And then all of a sudden you've got like five adjacent houses, which all have permits to have parking on street. Do we have a, a sense of, of how many cars actually could be in a street? through these waivers in a system that's easy to, uh, to, to, to reference or would be easy to reference? Yeah, good question, Andrew. Uh, so currently, you know, through our rental permit uh, registration uh, requirement um, where you have, um, if there's a rental, for instance, um, property, they need, they need to renew their rental permit on an annual basis. And, um, and that uh, includes a parking plan. And so, um, that records their parking spaces. And luckily we're now going electronic. Um, so that information um, actually can be exported into Excel, which then can be exported into GIS. So you can, we can currently uh, begin to do sort of data, data analysis. Um, so we currently have that um, and uh, we could, uh, so that's, that's real raw data that um, we're aware of now. Another thing just to point out is uh, par the permit, the proposal says the permit granting authority shall approve a parking management plan. And I just wanted to point this out a little bit. Um, so a parking management plan would be uh, under this proposal, a requirement for all, all parking, regardless if they provide two parking spaces per dwelling unit, or let's say 1.5 parking spaces or whatever the ratio um, is. Um, and so this is very important. Um, it's important for inspection services um, to, um, to um, enforce. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, sort of outline what does a parking management plan uh, mean. Um, it, it gets into, um, uh, it's an approval of, of the permit um, becomes a, a condition. So that gives inspection services teeth to use if needed. Um, it um, lays out the approved parking plan, the approved lease that gets into the parking, uh, um, and uh, which can get into, uh, you know, how many parking spaces are required or allowed for the, for the a unit. Um, are there any parking restrictions that would be spelled out in the lease? It also gets into what's the approved, um, how, how does that development designate those parking spaces? Is it with parking decals or parking signage? Uh, we would, um, what would be a condition of that approval would be those specific like 
stock photo of a sticker or um, construction um, drawing of the parking sign. Um, and that would have to um, be part of it. It also, uh, part of the approved parking management plan gets into a written narrative of specifying all this sorts of stuff. How many parking spaces are provided for the property? Um, how many are for the residential uses? Or if, if it's a mixed use building, uh, you know, how many parking spaces are for the retail uh, shop, the coffee shop? Um, it gets into a, a whole a host of different criterias. Um, one largely being how, how are the developer enforcing these sort of, um, these details. And um, it also gets into um, how is the developer going to, to um, propose or encourage his, their residents to, um, you know, maybe consider carpooling or having a bike share program located at their property? How are they going to keep, keep uh, implement that um, in the future? And that would be something for them to seek out and the permit granting authority could make an additional condition saying, you know what, we want you to come back next year and maybe every five years. And you're going to show us how you are actually encouraging your residents to reduce the need for parking and reduce the traffic uh, impact to the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and so um, there's a lot of information um, and there's a lot of power that both the Zoning Board of Appeals and Planning Board can do to um, provide safeguards uh, for ensuring that there is, uh, that the applicant or the developer is upholding what they, they told uh, in, in the public hearing process and making conditions that will, um, you know, keep, keep, uh, keep them at good faith. So can a quick fast follow, Jack? Yeah, sure. Which is just, so I, I love hearing how thorough that is. Um, it, I guess from a data perspective, makes me a little nervous, but you know, in terms of how we capture, I guess that the question I'm trying to, to get the answer for is like, we've heard some folks talk about specific streets with parking issues. Do we have an easy mechanism to say that, you know, there are 20 cars uh, that can park off street on Lincoln Road right now? Like, can, can you get that type of answer quickly? Because as we think about moving forward, if somebody else brings a new proposal, and it, it'd be really useful to understand what's currently in play that I, I think that would cause us to think yeah. differently no, about each proposal. Good, good question. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, the town can do a lot of stuff. The town can do its own parking study. The town has done previous parking studies. The town probably will do future parking studies. But it's important to put it back on the, on the applicant to pay for a parking study and do, do their work to show their evidence, to prove that there is maybe enough off on street or off street parking spaces in the vicinity of that proposed development. Um, and maybe other, other criteria um, listed here um, that's in front of your screen um, and have them do the due diligence that's required. And, you know, if the permit granting authority does not believe that developer, they have the discretion under I think um, MGL chapter 53G to do a peer review. And, um, and so what a peer review does is that, you know, the applicant would then say, all right, we will give the town money. Hold on, I gotta think about this. We will give the town money to pay for the peer review. And the town then hires a third party consultant to then review their work to prove or disprove that if their if their evidence is correct, and so th those are things that that the, the board, uh, you know, either board can use at any you know at any public yeah. hearing process. Yeah, no, I, I agree that they should do it. I guess it still comes back to do we do we have an inventory of what's there? So they could do a study and say, hey, we only need four, but if their neighbor and the next neighbor has already accounted for for all of those spaces, then even though they think they can do it, there's just not enough room. For the folks. So, anyhow, um, that that's where my head is on this now. Thanks for providing that additional detail. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Chris, you have your hand up, and then Doug and Janet. So, I just wanted to remind the board that um, I think Andrew's question is really good. Um, what um, Mr. Robleski? No, it wasn't Mr. Robleski. It was Amherst Media. 
Amherst Media provided documentation through their engineer about on-street and off-street parking. And they took um, photographs of the um, Gray Street, you know, at different times of the day and at different times of the week, et cetera, to show that if they weren't able to meet their parking requirements on site, which they, they had asked for a waiver, um, there was adequate space off-site for parking. So what I'm trying to say is that they provided, you know, empirical evidence that yes, there were unused parking spaces along Gray Street that could be used in the event of the need for overflow parking. If you had a situation where all the parking spaces were already taken up by other um, users, then you wouldn't have been able to provide that information. So I think that's the kind of information that the Planning Board or the Zoning Board of Appeals can ask for, um, you know, either have a parking consultant or, um, you know, an engineer or somebody go out and do a study to find out how are the on-street parking spaces being used to find out if they're available for use by a particular uh, applicant. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Doug? Thanks, Jack. So I had two things I was going to say, but I'm going to start with the third one, which was as I sat here and listened to Maureen reel off the uh, requirements that someone might have to do and associated with proving to the board or the whatever authority uh, the, how their parking plan is adequate and uh, studies and uh, leases and uh, permits and all that stuff. I'm thinking about accessory dwelling units and I'm thinking we are not making it user-friendly for people like me to build an accessory dwelling unit and uh, have a couple of extra or one or more cars, you know, at park on my yard. It sounds like it's onerous. And, um, you know, I think what we're describing is, is onerous enough that we're not, we're still going to be uh, discouraging small operators from doing development in our town. I think it's onerous enough that we're still going to have the larger players who are better capitalized and want to do bigger projects where they can spread those costs over multiple units. So uh, that was not on my uh, mind to say, but it, it certainly went through my head. So the second thing I wanted to ask is sort of picking up on something Janet said. Um, uh, I'm not sure I agree with Chris that uh, the changes to 7.91 only affect residential um, because 7.9, is it nine? Yeah, nine one used to refer to 7.0 and now it has the four specific subsections, but now 7.005, 7.01 and 7.02 are not mentioned in any place. And there's really no, you know, 7.9 waivers doesn't seem to directly apply to that. And maybe I'm wrong. Um, so Chris, maybe, or Maureen, you can, you can tell me how I'm, how I'm wrong. And then I guess the last thing I'll say is, um, I, I have no qualms with the substance of this amendment, but I, I don't agree with the way it's being structured. Uh, you know, if you're gonna, talk about the waiver process for different types of uses, then you structure it according to the uses. And as you go through each use, you talk about the waiver process. Or you, know, you set the requirements up front for each use. And then at the end, you have a waiver section that talks about all the waivers. So we've got kind of two different things going on in terms of the structure of the, um, of the bylaw and you know it's not the way I would write it but but I don't disagree with the substance thanks thank you Doug um, Maureen did you want to respond in any way or you can wait um, so um, I guess real real quick uh, about the ADU um, and you know is are we making this too 
onerous for a use such as a accessory dwelling unit, you know, the, the um, you know, there would be very sort of limited uh, amount of information needed for an ADU uh, since it's, you know, uh, up to three unrelated individuals that could live there. And so, you know, there would be, uh, you know, two parking spaces required, you know, maybe they want to request only one. Opposed, um, and so the types of information that, you know, the permit granting authority would need for that um, is just going to be, is going to be concentrated on just that, you know, that, that small request. And so, um, you know, I, I don't feel that, 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 um, it would take um, a whole lot of information or time for them um, to provide. And we probably would come up with some sort of um, formalized, uh, some sort of uh, standardized form of information that they would need to submit and probably could be a page or two. And, and certainly they would still need to continue to submit their parking plan, but they would need to say, you know, we have this kind of, uh, these, uh, you know, two spaces and, uh, for their tenants, and here is the lease, and um, the, these parking spaces will be maintained, and um, and so it probably would be sort of focused on those sort of uh, basic questions. As I think the density of a residential use increases, uh, sort of the level of detail and impact that it could have um, to the site and to the surrounding neighborhood um, increases, and so I would. Um, you know, I would uh, recommend that a permit granting authority, you know, increase the sort of amount of evidence that would need to be submitted um, as the density does increase. Um, about the uses under, um, um, under well, let's see here, 7.00, I, I kind of lost track of all the uses that you had mentioned um, of your confusion, but perhaps Chris um, got a better grasp. Maureen, do you, want, do you want me to repeat them? Yeah, that would be great. All right, so it looks to me like we've left out 7.005, 7.01, and 7.02. Okay, so, okay, so I made a little note in my bylaw. Okay, so, so let's see here. So, uh, seven, seven, okay, so 7.001 is listed, and that's for uh it looks like uh it looks like sort of boarding rooms lodging no 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 that was not one of them um, seven seven point zero zero five. Oh, okay yeah we'll start with that sure you had okay seven point zero zero five. Oh, okay for and all then, other uses then, oh you're right we could add, yep no thank and you then seven point zero one yeah i won't do this actually it's yep those, it's and then seven point zero two so I see what you're saying about five. One and two are listed. Um, can you see that on your screen? No, because the, the, what's on the screen has too many zeros. Maybe that's, is that the confusion? Uh, isn't there two zeros and then? I'm talking about 7.01. 7.01. Seven point zero one. And Jack, seven, can I help out with this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Seven point Chris. zero two. Jack mm. is giving me permission to help out with this. I All believe. right, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 still lost because I don't have a copy that everybody's looking at, and well, I'm just looking at frustrating. Looking at the zoning bylaw. Looking so at those this. aren't uses under seven point zero one or seven point zero two. I believe, except for the office. So, it, right, you're, they're not really uses under those two um, numbers, but 7.005 is a category of uses. But what it says is adequate parking spaces to accommodate under normal conditions. So it pretty much has a waiver built into it. The okay. applicant would provide the information to the permit granting board and then the permit granting board would decide whether they were providing adequate spaces or not. So there's really no opportunity to waive or modify anything. It's just, it is what it is. Um, the second, the one uh, 7.01 allows um, 
shared parking spaces to be provided within 800 feet in certain zoning districts. So that's not really something that would come under the um, provision to be waived. So um, previously it would have. Like right now, about, under, under the current bylaw that references 7.0, that, that could be waived. Yes. Chris, can I help? Yes, please, if Jack. So, yeah, uh, Jack, uh, thanks. Um, so all of the, these three sections that Doug has mentioned can still be waived under 7.9 for reasons of safety and site design. So okay. the, the section we've been looking at and focused on a 7.91 having to do with parking space requirements. So we identified this, the, the, the sections that have a value for a parking count, but 7.9 still exists and can, can modify any section of seven, okay. Article 7. All right. Thanks for that explanation, Rob. Great. Uh, Chris, did you want to? No, I have yeah. no further comment. All right, Janet. So um, I, I I think Doug's um, questions um, are a good segue. I don't know. I know we're trying not to discuss it, but just to understand what the provisions are or the, revi the revisions and provisions are saying. And so um, I wonder if it if we can put my if it's time to put my amendment up and I could people could look at it and then I could explain what I was thinking with it. And then I don't know if we're gonna we're trying not to we're trying to understand the change language and the amendments, but not discuss them in terms of like, I like it, I don't like it or something like that. But that's my understanding. So I wonder if it's a moment for the amendment, proposed amendment. Uh, Chris, you got your hand up. Yeah, I don't think we said that we weren't going to discuss this. I said that the main um, goal of tonight was to present it and have you understand it, but that doesn't prevent you from discussing it if you want to discuss it so just oh okay to... so i thought i thought okay i had the i had the impression we were just going to look at the language um try to understand it and then discuss it at a next meeting and you know maybe vote on it is is that do other members feel that way or did they understand that that way because i i actually have a lot of comments i could make about this but it to me it moves into like I like this about this. I don't understand this about this. You know, are we are we doing that for an amendment? A lot of us haven't looked at for much time, or um, is that it? Doesn't seem super useful to me. But I thought maybe if we we could present my amendment, um, I could that, say yeah, here's what I was thinking. Th that that has been distributed. So let's look at your amendment. I think that's that'd be appropriate. Chris, is your hand up? Yeah, my hand is up. I don't see right. why you can't discuss it, even though not everybody has had an opportunity to really study it. I think you can uh, put off your vote, but I think this is a good opportunity to discuss it because you're all here and meeting. So I wouldn't hold yourselves back from discussing it just because some of you haven't had time to really look at it. Um, I don't know if anybody has a different opinion, but it seems like this is an opportunity to ask questions, discuss it, not vote, but really try to understand it. And if you have questions, ask your questions. I agree. I agree. So, Pam, or do you have that? Yeah, we can. Um, I believe so, Jack. Hold on. I have an awful okay. lot of things. Can you remind me how you sent it? Did it come as a, um, a PDF? My guess it was included in um, the previous discussion when we discussed this article previously, which may have been, um, or we were going to discuss it on September 1st, but we didn't get to it. So it's, it could be in that packet. Pam, I think it's in. I think it's in the packet for tonight. I think I did include it in the packet for tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hold well on. It will just take me like 
15 minutes to find it. Hold on. It says from Janet McGowan, 9 slash 9 slash 21. It starts off with existing language. Yeah, page 39 in the packet. Hold on. We're getting there, guys. Hold on. Thank you. Okay. We're getting there. This is the packet, the seven, uh, the nine fourteen packet. Here we go. Here we are. Here we, we are. are. <laughs> My moment of fame. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. There's so many. Okay. Okay. So this is the waiver section that Doug was talking about, seven point nine, and the first section allows you to waive, um, you know parking requirements, regulations for compelling reasons of safety, aesthetics, or site design. And then 7.91 is the rest. That's the only other thing. And so it says that um, the parking space required under 7.0 may be modified when one or more of the following conditions are met. And so that would include all the condition, all the different circumstances and uses and residential uses and light industrial in um, section 7.0. Um, and so the first um, subsection says peak parking needs generated by on-site uses occur at different times. So, you know, your health club is only open at night or early in the morning, you know, your lunch rush is at a different time. 7.911, a significant number of employees, tenants, patrons, or other parking users of the site are common to and shared by more than one use at the site. So, um, you know, that circumstance. Um, and then 7.912 um, talks about, let's see. So is, is uh, sorry, Pam, just to interrupt. Do you, do you have the highlighted language one where it's in red? Keep going. Yeah, I think. Oh, thank you. Okay, good. There you go. Sorry about okay, that. So, and I, if you could get it all in one screen, that'd be fantastic, I think. Or like people could just read the entire 7.912, like pull it up a little bit. That's it. Um, so what I did with this section was I put all, you know, to one of the issues I have with the other zoning amendments is that issue that it, you're talking about what are really zoning waivers in a different part. And we already have a waiver section. So I tried to pull all of that in, into the waiver section. Um, so I'm trying, you know, the basic, you know, basic gist was to avoid creating confusion and conflicts with, on how the new language and 7.9 will work together. Um, this, you know, 7.912 references a parking management plan and has specific requirements for that plan that are talking about reduction in vehicle use and you know, Maureen was just talking about a different parking management plan or mark, and I was completely confused about when I read the original marking, parking management language in this, I was like, are these two different plans? So I'm like, put it all in one spot. And so that's one of the reasons to do it. I did add criteria and new language. Um, and basically this, the, 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 the point to me was to reconfirm that the parking needs of the tenants must be met it can be by a like by by a van pool, um, some kind of reduction in need, but always focusing on what the tenants need. Um, you know, for example, Aspen Heights has a daily van that runs from 7 a.m. to 7 
p.m. weekdays. And it, it just continuously circles from Aspen Heights on Route 9 to Town Center to the Campus Center. Um, and sometimes it, it also, it goes to Target. And so, you know, on alternate trips. And so that's an example of a apartment use, a, par a large apartment building that has reduced the need for parking by providing its students for access to campus downtown and, and shopping. And so, um, and then I listed criteria that says who has to provide, you know, what, you know, um, the shared lease spaces. I, so I listed all the different criteria here. Um, the factors to demonstrate the parking needs of the tenants may include shared or leased parking, shared lease spaces, um, bedroom count, number of tenants, local parking studies, local studies of mass transit and bicycle use, proximity to downtown, employment, medical services, food stores, you know, retail shopping and bus stops, um, year round bus schedules and maps and available off street parking. Um, and then I added, you know, different things in the parking management plan that would help um, make sure people could get to the places they needed to go. And I also added a contingency plan. Well, what happens if you haven't provided enough parking for your tenants, you have tried to do some reduction members, you know, measures, or you're close to a bus stop, but nobody's on the bus a contingency plan to make sure that, you know, you in some way in the future, you can provide parking. And so that's, that's the language. Um, so my focus, I also like, you know, there's a difference between mass transit use or bicycle use and availability. Um, you know, so one hand you might have, everybody can get on a bicycle and go somewhere, but actually very few people do and almost nobody does in the winter. And so that, that's, that's the focus of my criteria, what people are actually doing, not what we wish they were doing or they could be doing. Um, so that's, a, that's a not, not saying it's available, but people are using it. And um, you know, the PVTA reports to you know, the transportation department um, and there has been a reduction even before COVID about four or 5% a year of use of the local buses, despite the fact that we have more students there's a reduced use. And so that's, an, that's a fact that's important to know, not that there's a bus there, but no one's getting on it and they have a car instead. So it's just, it's just focusing on use. Um, I did not include the lease restriction language because not providing a parking space doesn't address the parking needs of the tenants. Um, and it's sort of like, um, you know, the tenants will have cars that we've seen by photograph to photograph and the lease, the, having a lease restriction and saying, well, I have a lease restriction, no one's gonna to need to park is really only pushing the parking burden somewhere else. And I just, I just think it's sort of, um, I think that's a very big move. I had, and even in my own draft, I had concerns about like, when you're gathering the information on bedroom count or, you know, um, how does that affect parking need? Do you say, oh, I have a four bedroom unit, so we're gonna need four spaces or is it really more important who's in the spaces or the age of the, sp age of the tenants or are they students. Um, so like, how do you apply, how would the board apply that information saying, okay, we have 10 three bedroom units. That means they need X spaces. And like, so how are they gonna do that calculation? And um, by making it flexible, it gives the board flexibility to consider all these different factors. But the question is, how does the board do that? Um, most places just sort of pick square footage, unit count, you know, what zoning district you're in and then give you a number. And so I just, I just wondered about that. Um, I wondered about what factors actually in Amherst affect, affect parking need. Is it the type of tenant, the age, the income, you know, undergraduate versus graduate, um, family size, you know, what, I don't know. Um, I really think we need to do parking studies before we make the changes so we, we know what our community needs are. Um, and also to give us time to see how the recent parking waivers have been uh, work because six out of the six buildings that have gotten parking waivers, only two have been built. So I think that data would be helped inform what the real criteria, the important criteria is for Amherst. Um, and I think that's it. Um, I just wondered if we should add criteria about like rentals, um, owner occupied students, unrelated adults on things like that. So that's my, my thing, but I do, you know, I, I do feel like the amendments that are being proposed really conflict with this parking waiver and all that information can go in here. So anybody reading the bylaw is like, okay, 
I'm required to two parking spaces per unit. And then, but there's a waiver at the end and here's how the waiver works. Right now, I think it's sort of a conflict of language and confusing. Um, and certainly I, it's been confusing to me. So that's a lot of information. But um, Chris or anyone from uh, the town, Rob, uh, want to respond to any of Janet's points at this time? Or uh, questions. Okay, Maria. So I just want to take a step back about um, <clears throat> what was the spirit of this parking amendment, and it was basically to not do a parking waiver. We were trying to avoid having the four hour long meetings we were having before this board, this current board, where we were discussing literally the factors that Maureen listed as far as deciding what was adequate parking. And so, and that was because we were getting all these parking waivers coming to us for these mixed use projects. So the spirit of the, the sort of big push for this amendment was to not have a parking waiver hurdle, but to actually embed in the zoning bylaw requirement for um, now it's um, all residential instead of leaving out the one family, two family townhouse dwellings. Um, it's now just to say, okay, if you wanna do something with housing, here is how we're gonna judge whether you are providing adequate parking embedded in section 7.40 and put it all there because the planning board, I don't know about the zoning board, but the planning board was having, uh, it was like two mixed use projects come back to us four or five meetings four hour meetings each discussing a waiver. And so I don't know why we're going back to that. I thought the whole spirit of this push was to um, actually, you know, put in the zoning. Let's use the criteria that the planning board has been discussing and show the potential developers, landowners, what they need to provide if they want to provide less than the two parking spaces per dwelling unit. So here are the factors and Maureen listed all of them. And I, I, I agree, I think the substance is great. Um, I did not <laughs> comb through it the way Doug did as far as you know, 7.001 or 7.01. And, um, but I agree that the substance is there and I understand the spirit of it, but I don't think the parking waiver was the spirit of the whole reason this amendment was um, studied. I thought we're trying to move away from that. So, um, so I don't have any comments about what Janet presented, but I just, I, I wonder if that is true what I'm saying or, or, or has it diverged from that original sentiment and now it's back to maybe we want a waiver. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Chris. I agree with what Maria said. We're trying to get away from the waiver. We're trying to give information upfront about what might be required um, for a developer to um, justify the number of parking spaces that he's providing. Um, and so that was really the spirit of this uh, amendment here. Yes. That's, that, is, uh, that, that is huge uh, to have them know that they're gonna need to do a parking study and provide the information, you know, first from the get-go. Um, Janet and then Maria. So, um, you know, in terms of links of meetings, um, I think with Michi at the Southeast Commons, it, it took four or five times, mostly, uh, you know, for a bunch of reasons. A lot of times he didn't have the information we wanted and we had to come back. We did spend a long time um, talking about parking, but it wasn't like 20 or 25 hours. Um, I think, you know, adding more criteria addresses this to some extent. Um, but it, I actually do think this is really calls, you know, having each developer come in and do a parking study of local needs in an 800 you know, foot area. And, you know, it, it's, I don't think that's going to save time. I, I actually think if we had more widespread studies of parking studies done of apartment complexes, 
you know, low income senior versus student versus, you know, regular families, we'd have a knowledge base as, a, as boards to basically make the evaluation. You know, you, you have to bring two parking spaces per unit. That's been working really well. Somebody wants a waiver and we could look at the project and say, yeah, you could waive it. Or let's do the Aspen Heights, have a van pool. That's also in the waiver. Um, so I don't, I don't know that going, you know, project by project, always doing separate studies and talking about it, like what's more important bedroom count versus, you know, whatever is going to really slow things down. Um, I do see the need for clarity, but I think actually I'm trying to do is clarify in the context of the waiver, the factors to be considered for a reduction in parking need. Um, I think it's, you know, so, you know, I don't want to beat that point home, but right now we have something at the front of the, par the parking bylaw and something at the back and the language does not particularly agree for to make that much sense together. Uh, thank you. Uh, Maria? Oh, I forgot to add that another point, a, a big picture reason for the amendment was also because we um, thought that the two spaces per unit was um, in some instances not appropriate and that it should be less, it maybe should be more, but that that was another, it wasn't just to get rid of the parking waiver, but also that we were, we wanted to uh, note that two spaces per unit wasn't working for a lot of projects. Um, and so having the criteria um, prepares potential developers and uh, property owners to know what to present. And I like that statement that, um, I think it was Maureen who said, you know, the evidence needed changes per size of project. In other words, you know, an ADU or one family dwelling is not going to be looking to do a traffic impact reports, but then obviously an apartment complex would, a um, mixed use project would. So um, I like the substance, how it's upfront and saying, you know, here are the factors you need to provide if you want to provide 1.5 or one unit, oh, parking space per unit. And it doesn't look like a waiver. It looks like it's like, here are your options. And I, I like that about it because one of the things was I personally didn't think the two uh, spaces per unit was fair for the entire entirety of the town. I felt like different neighborhoods, different density areas needed um, to be studied and not be held to the same two units per dwelling unit. And, um, and I can't say what it is. It's different for every town. It's different for every street and every neighborhood. But that what's here, the substance provides that sort of flexibility. So, um, so I, I don't honestly, I don't know what I would change or improve. I know that Doug had a lot of specific things that obviously got picked up. But um, yeah, I kind of like the spirit of this because it's doing what we would hope, which is provide flexibility, um, not make it seem like an onerous thing for developers to come here because like, oh no, I have to apply for a parking waiver immediately. And that's another hoop. So, um, and, and the criteria, you know, maybe as time goes, we can change it when we realize uh, there are other factors that we would like to see, or some of these factors never get presented. So um, again, it's not kind of like what we've been saying for all these article amendments, you know, over time, ideally these are evolving and changing to how, you know, it works as far as the planning staff, what they come across. So, um, so yeah, that my, I guess my long story short is that I forgot that um, another point of this amendment was that the two spaces per dwelling unit was something that was always a, um, a difficulty in the projects, at least for the planning board that was on. I can't speak for the zoning board, so. Yep, I agree, Maria. Uh, Tom? Um, I was actually just, my, my comments were almost identical to what um, Maria was just saying. I was gonna raise the fact that um, I think there were issues with the fact that certain sites um, made it virtually impossible to be developed with two parking spots per, um, per unit. And um, I think the same might even go for commercial in some places based on what we have. But, but, but I mean, the, the nature of it was to, uh, to put the onus on the developer to give proof uh, upfront as to um, what number of parking spots they should have and why. 
um, rather than it be something that, um, and, and again, and the reason I think, Janet, yeah, I, I do agree that we can do some studies now, but I think there's also a lot of conditions that we haven't examined yet. And I think we want to put that burden on the, um, you know, the developer to say, okay, well, here's this condition. It's this wide, it's, you know, fronting downtown, or it's in a, um, a more residential area that we haven't really looked at in terms of scale before or the size of property or access points. So I think, you know, each one's going to be unique. And I think if we are upfront about asking the developer to show us that data, um, A, we have that data and we have all that that we can collect and, and use in the future. Um, but it's also something that um, we can ask of them um, really simply upfront without asking them to provide a waiver. You know, you know what what is uh, um, a little bit disturbing to me is uh, is this is this recent revelation that UMass parking is is maxed out because I always thought like um, that was always underutilized versus maxed out and I just for me that's a game changer in terms of our parking situation in this town. Um, I mean, I you know I saw all the photos. I know around my house. You know, there's this, there's this, you know, eight cars in a driveway. Uh, it's kind of, it, it's just, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of crazy. And I, I think, you know, sometimes we want to solve all our parking problems with this bylaw, and probably, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, but I did have one question for Rob um, with regard to. We got some comments. Uh, I tried to get some information from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. But the, um, with regard to the type of parking and, and the surface, is there a missed opportunity here to encourage like low impact development, um, you know, for these, you know, parking surfaces, parking lots, if they become that, that large? Is this, is this something that the town, you know, in terms of a sustainable sort of thing, stormwater management, uh, is that an opportunity that we're missing here? So I, I, I think that's something we're definitely interested in, but we are at this point not looking at the design standards of sections, uh, Article 7, and that's where we would be addressing that type of, uh, those types of issues. Uh, but yeah, we are, we are absolutely interested in that. Okay. All right. Um, uh, Janet. So to address some of Tom's concerns, um, I don't, I think I might've muddied the waters by, you know, like my basic feeling is we need more information before we make changes to the parking um, um, bylaw, but let's push that aside. And I think that that kind of information about what the developer needs to provide is in this language, my, my red language, because it's, it's listing the factors. I've just, I've actually added some factors and taken some out of the things. And I think I'm putting it in a place that it's easy for people to see it's all in one spot. Um, so it is it is providing flexibility and kind of information of like, hey, this is what the board will be looking at. Um, in terms of like the complexity of applying for a parking waiver, it's like when you fill out your, um, it's like just saying, you, there's like a check and you're just seeking, a, you know, what waivers you're seeking, you check parking, and then you would provide the information. So it's not like a big um, crazy, um, administrative procedure or special permit. So I think what I'm trying to do is just sort of clarify, here's the rule. And then here's, you can, you don't, you can get a waiver to the rule and there's three or four reasons, you know, it's not just 7.912, there's other earlier ones. They're all in one place and they cover all parking. There's not like this kind of parking versus that. So I'm trying to make it sort of simple, but also laying out the criteria that developers will know. Um, when to apply things, you know, and the, what, what the board will be looking at. You know, personally, I'm not, a, I'm a little confused about what the criteria means and what the studies would show or what the impacts would be. I'm not sure the board, as they apply these, will have any more clarity than what one of the, the chair said at, at uh, 462 Main Street, we're basically guessing here, you know, and stuff. So, but, but part of the clarity we're gonna get is when the four buildings are built, which have reduced parking, you know, Southeast Street Commons was what, less than one parking space per unit. How did that work out? And we'll be able to know and look at that. We're not there yet, but I, I, I'm trying to do is keep the bylaw sort of coherent and 
have the sections kind of work together, not against each other or in a confusing way. And I'm hoping that I'm incorporating those criteria and concerns and helping developers see you know, the path forward. Thank you, Janet. Tom? Hey, Janet, I'm not, I'm not actually against your language. I think it's the fact that the default is still two parking spaces per unit, which is something that over the years we've, I mean, prior to myself being on this, um, um, this board, but you know, from what I've gathered and also from recent projects, two is not the answer. So it doesn't really work in small conditions and it doesn't really work in urban downtown conditions and it doesn't work in backyard lots, right? So two is just not working. So let's actually go to a criteria that's gonna, gonna fit, you know, so we're not saying do this or get a waiver. We're just saying the rule is this um, because two doesn't work no matter how you cut it. So I think it just yeah. simplifies the process because it's not an either or. So when I've, when I've looked at other towns like Northampton and, you know, Somerville, you know, which I, I still have a leg in, um, you know, usually they pick unit count, you know, district, like the core district versus the less core district. Um, they, they do pick a number and it could be based on square footage and they, they, they pick a number and then they tell you how many spaces, you know, you required per, for your square foot. And in a way we're trying to have the, everything and then you know most places literally have a number tied to some factor and probably have a waiver requirement right and so you know we pick two spaces per unit that may be the wrong number it used to be 1.5 and now it's two and you know people living next to a student house would say it should be four per unit right and so that's information that we could look at and gather and say okay have we picked the right number have we picked the right factor we haven't done that work, but most communities don't say, you know, here's a here's the smorgasbord of factors. Tell us what you'd like to build, and we'll see how it goes. I, I haven't seen that flexibility. That's part of our data collection, right? So we can't make those decisions or predictions about the future without that collection. And so the, yeah. I think the process is trying to do that. That's yeah, all. and I, and I think you know, I think most communities they you know they have been revising them, but it's based on data. But they do pick a number and they tie it to some factor you know, unit, square footage, number of beds, you know, the location in the downtown core versus the outer core, you know, it's, it, they can be quite extensive, but they're, they're picking a number and sticking with it most of the time. And it gives developers clarity. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering like if we're kind of pulling away from prescribed right. numbers, and then is this like a form-based approach to, to our parking solution? Uh, which again, I'm intrigued by that concept, but that the form base, I, I always look to Maria for <laughs> what, you know, is this analogous to what a, you know, form based sort of, you know, architectural sort of uh, design standard would be, is it kind of embedded in this approach that we're trying to take? Um, Maria, then uh, Maureen. Uh, Maureen should talk. She's the expert. Okay. Yeah, she is. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yes, actually, this is this is uh, the planning department's proposal is based on principles um, such as form based code. Uh, Congress for New Urbanism, um, uh, as well as many other smart growth toolkits out there. Um, you know, I actually uh, turned to uh, MAPC, the Regional Planning Agency for the Boston area, which uh, got into a lot of the, the concepts that I uh, used as uh, the framework for this revised proposal. And I read a lot of um, different states uh, sort of toolkits for looking at parking requirements. And they all have a very um, common thread is uh, thinking about providing it's I think it's a new it's going to be a new term uh, providing flexible parking requirements and when you are uh, permit granting authorities are, uh, are thinking about that or considering um, what is that that what is that that sweet spot what is that number for uh, development um, it's site specific it's neighbor specific. It's not static. It's not based on some 
parking study that was done three years ago. Uh, it's it's based on real live data that's um, in real time, um, and um, and this is where um, the real th common theme is is that they put in uh, considerations that are. Uh, that are specific to locational factors and uh, sometimes uh, demogra demo uh, demographic uh, factors. And so I went through um, the bulleted list in our proposed uh, revision um, it, one by one, and they all are, are locational factors um, looking at you know access to public transit, the proximity and connectivity to downtown and, and public transit, um, and looking at parking studies to see you know what is what is in real time, what is the parking reality uh, on private lots, um, on public lots, on street parking spaces within the vicinity of that development? And so if you do have the neighborhood filled with, you know, uh, you know, 10 parking spaces crammed in a parking in uh, in park in um, properties, you know, all around the, the property and with, you know, no parking spaces on the street, that parking study is going to capture that information in real time. And the one kind of, if you actually want to zoom out even more, if you want to zoom out slightly, you could think about these individual developments that would have a parking sp uh, study uh, required and, and, a, and maybe a traffic impact report is that it's giving you a glimpse of what is, uh, you know, what is what is the conditions and, and boards can reference it and the, and the planning department, the town can reference it and sort of piece together what is what is the situation? That would be something outside of the public hearing process, but it's something that I think is valuable information. And I do believe that, you know, in addition to, you know, public um, parking studies and traffic impact reports that would be par part of a public hearing process, you know, I, I think that, it, 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 it is, uh, you know, a point well taken. The town should should uh, continue doing parking studies in the downtown and, and village centers and wherever, um, you know, is deemed appropriate um, for our own, you know, data and, and analysis. But these uh, requests um, would be would be specific to that to that um, development and would be um, timely to that development. And something that, you know, another condition that a board could put on is to revisit the parking needs. And Janet did touch upon something that I liked, uh, which I forget what you, what you called it, but um, um, but what I refer to it is uh, shadow parking. I can't recall if I've mentioned it in this forum or if in just uh, CRC meetings. Um, it's shadow parking or another term for it is called uh, landscape reserves where, you know, the permit granting authority could say, oh, um, we'll grant you th that reduced amount of parking, um, but, you know, let's do a safe to fail method. Let's still require you to provide, um, you know, this amount of parking spaces that you don't need to develop. And you'll have to make that sort of a grassy area or maybe a gravel area, maybe it's ground cover. And in the event for the entire life of that development, um, if we feel as a board or in for, uh, inspection services finds out that there's actually a parking issue, um, a condition would say, you will have to go back to the planning board or you'll have to go back to the ZBA and revisit this. And, you know, based on that meeting and, and the conversations, you know, the board could say, you know what, actually that shadow parking, we want you to build it. You're going to build that parking lot because the parking need um, is has changed and we we need you to do that and so that's something that you know currently you could do that as is right now with your discretionary power um, so I just wanted to say that very good thank you Maureen that was uh, excellent uh, Maria then Janet I, I don't think I could have said it any better boy I actually learned quite a bit from what Maureen just said and I think that's great that you're using smart growth sort of the latest um, studies and the latest sort of uh, ways to tackle this really complicated problem and I, I think exactly that it needs to be parcel by parcel I think a blanket statement for, especially for parking just wasn't working and um, 
uh, as far as the shadow and all these things, I think, like I was saying, I think this uh, bylaw could definitely evolve and grow and change as we see needs, um, you know, show up more and more in certain neighborhoods or streets. Um, but I think this is a good start. And um, yeah, no, I, thanks for that, Maureen. That was really great, really educational. And Janet? I have a question about, you know, the parking study. So when I was thinking about the parking study, I was going to, I was focusing on use. Um, and so not just like how many cars are, you know, in the neighborhood, but how many people are in the neighborhood. And so if I was doing my 800 square foot area, which, you know, um, so some of it will be residential homes. It might be families. It might be single people. It might be group home, you know, unrelated individuals. And so is that part of the survey? You know, like there's a, there's a sixplex on Main Street, you know, there's six units, there's 12 cars in the parking lot. It, and will you, will they be studying like how many people there are and how many cars there are? Um, or just when you're starting to look at types of people, we're seeing that students have more cars than most families or per person. I don't think that, I don't think you could say, you know, you could do the numbers of how many cars are in Amherst if you could find that information. But I'm just wondering, are you also going house to house saying this house has four cars and two units, or this house has, you know, four people living there and four cars. This, this house has three people in one car. Is that part of the data collection? Like, yeah, good question. So, you know, um, as I mentioned before about the rental permit um, uh, process, um, you know, part of the data collection for that, for the annual renewal of the rental permit um, gets into how many tenants and how many units and how many um, parking spaces are provided. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that's certainly something attainable um, to provide um, if that's, you know, of interest of, of the board that, you know, that permit granting authority um, that would want that part of the, the study. And so, again, that's part of the dialogue between the permit granting authority and that developer is what, what do you, um, you know, we can we can provide you uh, general guidance tonight about what is part of a parking study, but you know you could provide specific you know request of that developer to get into that nitty gritty, and you could do that today. So not with even the proposal, you you could if you are proposing you know requiring a parking study of a developer, you you could uh, make those requests to the developer. All right. Um, uh, are there any other comments? Because uh, we do have clarification, and I, you know, we certainly can. We now know that we can, you know, accept public comment on these bylaws during this, uh, during the public hearing regarding a zoning bylaw as we're deliberating. Um, and uh, so, if there's any objection, I'd like to see if there's some public comment out there that. Uh, we could listen to. All right. All right. Let's so the, the public attendees are seven. If anyone uh, would like to um, provide public comment on this, um, I see Pam Rooney. Pam? I can't hear anyone. <laughs> Hi, Pam Rooney, 42. Oh, five, 42 there you five. go. Yeah. Um, I was waiting for my unmute blue button. Thank you. Um, I would support starting with the premise of two parking spaces um, per dwelling unit. Uh, and then with your ability to modify that given the, the various circumstances, to me that erased all of the con the confusion that was that was you know why why were we differentiating between apartments versus duplexes versus townhouses versus and I think having that basis of two uh, a starting point of two per dwelling unit is um, it's sort of clean and you better you better be sure that if if they don't want to build that much they will they will let you know but um, starting at that point makes sense to me. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Dorothy Pan, please. Hi, Dorothy. Hi. Um, I, I do agree with that. I, I do. Um, we have to know that people, things change, buildings change, and you have to be prepared, which is why uh, what Janet talked about shadow parking, which is definitely required at the 132 Northampton um, project, um, the ability to expand if needed. Um, so that would relate to the question about the ADUs. Um, yes, you might have somebody who is in your, your backyard unit who, only, who needs no parking or need, has only one car, but you have to have a plan for the future because someone else in the future could be a couple with two cars because they have to go to two different jobs and public transportation would take two and a half hours each way as opposed to 20 minutes by car. So um, that means you don't pave over everything for the, for the parking, but that you are prepared to deal with things as they come up. Um, I, I think we have to not just think about inconvenience for builders, we have to think about convenience for people who are gonna come and live in these apartments. We want people to want to live downtown. We want them to be successful and to be able to do what they need to do. So we have to think about their needs as well as the needs of developers. So I think there's an equitable way to do it. Um, and I think it's important to be evidence-based, okay? And, and not, um, as Janet said, Talk about what people do, not what you wish they do. And of course, people's behavior can change over time. Our public transportation can improve over time. Uh, there can be other things and better ways of moving people around uh, besides just private cars. But right now we're dealing with how where people are now. And um, in terms of Jack's question about the UMass parking, when this was brought up at a meeting at town council, I think yesterday, um, somebody Googled it. Okay, Steve Schreiber Googled it and he it confirmed the letters we'd received. Yes, it is all sold out. Okay, because we'd received a bunch of letters yesterday of people that were freaking out because they didn't know what to do with their cars. So it is a problem. Um, and I think that um, Jennifer Taub took a lot of pictures of crazy parking all over Lincoln um, Avenue today, where they're just parking in every spot they can find. Um, and Steve Schreiber also said cars were parked in bizarre places on campus places where he didn't used to see cars. So we, we have a problem. And um, we increase our density, increase our, our, our you know, population downtown. We have to increase parking in many different ways. But I like it to be unobtrusive. I, I agree with some of the plans that Christine talked about much earlier in our zoning process of parking in the back, but having parking and shared parking wherever possible. So, so that's my thoughts. Thank you, Dorothy. OK, thank you. Um, so, um, you know, it's 823. Um, I, I'd like to have this meeting conclude and I'm wondering uh, if we're okay with the continuance and, and do we really need another meeting or if we just get a fresh document that we all can see, uh, will it really, can we not fit it into the next meeting, uh, Chris? or try to anyway. Yeah, so we have two things that we need to deal with. One is, um, actually we might have three, but anyway, the one thing is this, this parking issue. Another thing is the um, mixed use building standards. Um, the planning department has come up with a, a modification to allow more flexibility as to where the non-residential use can be. And we wanted to present it to you and uh, have you decide whether you wanted to recommend it to town council or not. And then the other thing is that the apartments um, bylaw went underwent some change, uh, the apartment zoning amendment underwent some change at CRC, and we wanted to present that to you and have you have an opportunity to vote on that. So I was going to propose that you have an extra meeting next Tuesday, which would be the 21st. I know Janet said that she couldn't be available for a planning board meeting on the 22nd, but I wondered what the availability of people for the 21st would be. And it would um, involve um, further discussion about this parking issue and uh, voting on whether you wanted to recommend the parking um, zoning amendment or not. Um, and also, if you didn't wanna to get to mixed use buildings tonight, you could deal with that then, as well as dealing with 
the um, change that the CRC um, has put into the apartments bylaw. So are you willing to meet on the 21st? And um, the reason that I'm pushing this is because there, it, the clock is ticking and the planning board held four public hearings along with CRC on July 21st. It, there was mixed use buildings, apartments, parking and accessory dwelling units. The town council has 90 days after the close of the public hearing to um, vote on these zoning amendments. Otherwise you have to go back and have another public hearing. So um, in order to have the town council be able to vote in 90 days, they would have to vote by October 18th. Since they wanna have a first reading and a second reading, they would need to have their first reading on October 4th and then their second reading on October 18th. So if we have, if we wanna have a chance of um, getting these um, amendments to town council and have them vote on them this fall without having to go back to have another public hearing, it, it's kind of, um, there's a, a need or a, a sort of a, a pressure to um, complete this work before the end of September. Um, and then we need to write uh, the planning board reports. I've written one of them and I've sent it out to you already on mixed use buildings, but that one's not quite done if we wanna consider this, um, this tweak that we've made to the mixed use building. So anyway, I would like you to be able to meet on the 21st or possibly, I don't wanna have you meet twice in one week, but you could meet on the 28th. You already have a meeting on the 29th, but it's got a lot of material in it. And I'm afraid that there wouldn't be enough time to really, um, handle zoning bylaws there wouldn't be any, you wouldn't have the bandwidth for it on that night so are there any takers for the 21st um i know i'm i'm okay with that uh show of hands um maria tom you're, you're iffy johanna i'm iffy my husband has a board meeting that night for amherst baseball from seven to eight and andrew's so. iffy I, I have a conflict and I would have to decide which organization I want to support. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not gonna discount anyone's effort these past six months, nine months, <laughs> year, we've been meeting like crazy um, and doing a lot. Um, is there is there sort of a priority list because um, the parking, um, you know, is it really, you know, if we had to do a notice another public hearing, you know, I mean, the parking amendment came to us, sort of, you know, it's just, it's like we normally we do a the norm the process that I'm used to is having the planning board work with the planning department on different versions and raise questions, the zoning subcommittee doing all that work. We've received these amendments as kind of born documents and had a public hearing really quickly. And now we're doing all that footwork. And I think we're doing good work on these amendments. Um, and now, now we're on a time crunch. And I wonder is, you know, is it, you know, is there a priority to the parking amendment? Could we just keep working on it maybe in a smaller group and kind of keep tweaking it? Because, it, you know, we've had some really major changes and I, I don't think it's close. Um, is that a problem really not to bring that to town council by mid October? Could we do another public hearing, that kind of thing? It's like, um, but I, I think, you know, in a way we, we've been given a huge thing and we've worked really hard towards it. And I think it's sort of unachievable to do it all by wrap it up by October 15th. Um, I actually was going to ask like, how would I get specific comments on language to the board in a way that is, you know, doesn't, we don't have to sit as seven people and listen to it, but read it maybe before a meeting. So I think there's more work to be done on the parking amendment. And I think the mixed use we've already voted on. And then George Ryan and Evan Ross had this idea, this different idea. And so I feel like we keep on getting all this stuff and we're, you know, I, I don't know how many times we can meet in a month or how many months we can keep this up and I'm not even quite sure why we're on this push. The town council could vote on things in November or December or January. You know, there's no, 
what's the urgency with like five amendments? Is there some priority list that we could focus on just a few? Well, I think we have four amendments. You, you have four amendments. I'm sorry for butting in. I should have. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Um, you have four amendments before you, apartments, mixed use buildings, parking, and accessory dwelling units. You've done a lot of work on all four of them. I would be disappointed to see um, those fall off the wagon, but I suppose if one of them needed to fall off, it could be parking. That's probably the least, um, the least crucial. Uh, but I would certainly urge you to try to get as many of them done as possible. Is there any chance you could meet on Monday, the 20th of September? Uh, everybody look at their schedule. Um, I think I'd rather meet at the end of the month myself. I just, I, I'm sort of exhausted by this weekly pace and I feel like I'm not getting stuff done. The, the 20th would work for me. Same. Uh, 20th is good for me. Show of hands for the 20th. Where, where's my hand? There it is. Uh, good, 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 good. Iffy for Andrew. And where did Janet go? Janet is here, but she might be checking her calendar. Oh, okay. I have, I have design review board at 5 to 6 30. Um, and there's quite a few things on that agenda. So my, I don't know what is going to happen with that hard stop. Maury might know more than I would, but um. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we do. I was about to chime in and say, oh, we have a DRB meeting on the twentieth. We could start five. later. We could start later. Start at seven. Yeah. That that would and uh, we do end um, the DRB meetings at six thirty, and it would be nice to have a thirty minute. <laughs> So yeah, seven o'clock is an option. If, Janet, if how do you... Tom is fine with it. Um, I, I just don't want to keep meeting every week and going faster and faster. Like, I, I feel like I'm not, you know, I mean, we've done this for months and I, I don't, I feel like we're skimming through things. I think we ran through apartments, um, you know, without even some build out diagrams or any ownership, you know, we didn't look at ownership or consolidation or impact. I mean, I just could, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of meeting next week. I, I think we need some time to reflect and work on it. Um, you know, this parking amendment, every time we see it has major changes in it. And what's it going to look like on Monday? I don't know, but I well, haven't. There are some housekeeping things that we can, like Chris said, I mean, the parking, maybe, maybe not, but the other stuff seems, you know, low hanging fruit for us to approve and at least make a recommendation. So Monday would be covering what then? Mixed use and? Mixed use and apartments and then parking if you could get to it. And there've been changes to the apartments that we don't know about. There's one change and the one change, I'll report on it now if, if it's okay with Jack. Sure. Um, the idea is to um, keep the cap on in the BG planning district. So in other words, you wouldn't be able to build an apartment building with more than 24 units in the BG and that is kind of a holding pattern um, because we otherwise weren't able to really come up with a good solution for how to keep apartment buildings from overtaking the BG. So that was the change in apartments. The change in mixed use buildings, as I said before, has to do with giving some flexibility as to where the 40% of the ground floor area of a mixed use building could occur? Could it occur on another floor? Could, um, could you have part of the 40% on the ground floor and have part of the 40% elsewhere in the building? So that's what that's about. And then you have, you already approved ADUs. So I don't think we have to go back to that. And then you um, have this parking issue. So it will be those three things. Mixed use buildings so apart. So, um, uh, Doug, please. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess I want to just reflect that at the beginning of this meeting, we had some public comment and comment from people on the board and staff that you know maybe we wanted to delay the vote on the parking to a later meeting, but it seems like the way the conversation went 
you know, we kind of ran out of things to say, uh, you know, around quarter after eight. Um, you know, Janet had put an amendment out. Um, you know, I heard a couple of people say they they kind of liked what the planning department had proposed. Um, you know, I'm I guess I'm just kind of wondering how much more do we really have to say about it? You know, if we came, you know, either first at some point in the next meeting had a fairly quick vote on on Janet's amendment and then went on into a vote because uh, it just felt like the, we kind of had run out of things to say and we got very few public comment. So I'm not sure how time consuming it would be to finish this one off. Yeah, for me, it's just a clerical thing in terms of getting the information. Um, and, you know, just looking at it on the screen, it, it's not so, but I think if, if we get, you know, copies and that, and a, and a fresh PDF that, um, you know, it make, you know, huge difference uh, to me, but I do agree, Doug. Uh, Janet? So the comments were that people hadn't seen it and they wanted to see it and participate. Um, and the fact that people didn't have detailed comments on something that was shown on the screen doesn't surprise me. I do have detailed comments that would go line by line, not every line. And I was trying to, I, before I was just asking, like, how would I get those? You know, like if, if I got this recent, the September 4th draft as a um, Word document, I could do the track changes or I could do the comments on the side and get that to the planning board members and the and the planning staff so they could see that. So I did I do have much more. I thought we weren't going to go into super deep stuff. Um, and so I, I there is more to say that on this. I, you know this seems so rough to me. I, I, I don't know what like it's not a priority. It's there's not a big push on it. It's it's been coming to us like like you know every hour I open up an email and there's a new thing. Um, so I don't know if if we want to just rush through it and you know do it do that, I guess we could do that, but I do have more to say and it's it's sort of detailed. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, some at some point we just have to go with the information we have. I mean, it's, I understand, I understand your, your point, Janet, but um, uh, Chris, you have your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to say that Janet could send her comments to me and we could forward them to the rest of the planning board members in advance of the meeting on the 20th. And that would be a way of Janet getting her comments um, into the record. And then you could choose to discuss them or not discuss them on the 20th. Well, I, I would think like similar to, to the comments you got from Doug, the ones you like, you'll recommend, you know, if you like any of them, but um, um, so are we, Doug? i just give up. Yeah, I, I guess I will say from personal experience that when I sent my email into the planning board last night with some comments on the uh, the bylaw proposal, and uh, you know, I was uh, pretty surprised that they took them to heart and thought about them today, and were able within 24 hours to come back with some adjustments. Um, I didn't expect that. And, um, you know, I, I simply thought uh, they would be distributed to the board for discussion tonight. So, um, you know, that, that approach is available to all of us. Yeah, it, it, we, don't, we want to give, the, <laughs> give them more than 24 hours. <laughs> that, that was amazing. Um, so are we meeting on Monday at 7? Um, Stu, uh, a show of hands. I'm good, good, good. Tom, good. Uh, Yana's good. Andrew's a maybe. And Janet? Janet's a no. Okay. Uh, I can try, but I, I just don't feel like we can prepare or do a good job. I'm just. Okay. All right. They don't care, they don't care. <laughs> Huh, <laughs> how'd that happen? Um, 
Okay, so, you know, I hate not to have all of us there. But, so we're meet, you know, the proposals will meet the 20th and then the next time would be, was it? The 29th. 29th. Okay. Well, personally, um, I'm at a little bit of a, um, I, I'm not sure where to go from here. Uh, if anyone has thoughts, uh, we, we power through on this on Monday or not. What about um, the 28th? That gives some time. I, yeah, I feel like I'd be better prepared you want to meet two nights in a row, the 28th and the 29th? As long as they're not four hours. <laughs> that would be good for me. So any thoughts on the 28th and 29th? That's tough. Either works for me. I could do the 20th or I could do the 28th. OK, it, yeah. Well, Hopefully we'll be meeting as much, you know, this fall and we're just kind of like doing our good work, but show of hands for the 28th. I'm free. Johanna. Maria. Maria. Andrew. Andrew. I just, <laughs> I, I, I've got, I've got to get other schedules and look to see what, what I can and can't do. I just, I can't react as quickly. That's all. Uh, I didn't think I could make it today, but. Okay. Doug? Um, Doug was a yes. How about Maria? She was good. Yeah. And Jack is a yes? Yeah, I'm a yes. So, all right. So let's go ahead and meet on the 28th and have it a short meeting, uh, as short as possible. And maybe put the parking item last on the agenda. Make sure okay. we get through the other stuff. You want to meet at 6.30? Oh, yeah, should work. 30 on the 28th. Andrew just had his hand up. Yeah, Andrew. It was, it, it was just to ask for the time. So 6.30? Yeah. OK. So I'm just plugging that in my phone here. Um, OK. Um, All right, um, so I think we've decided that and we can uh, move on to the next item. Are, we, are you good, Chris, with the plan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so next item, oh, are we, this is the item B here, are we? I think you're gonna put that off until the 28th. Oh, okay, okay, all right. So let's do the uh, election of officers and planning board reorganization. Um, you know, I'd like to step down. You know, I, I think I have, you know, a slate of people I would recommend uh, and I can do that now. I'd recommend Doug Marshall as the chair, Tom Long as a vice chair and Maria to continue as a clerk. Uh, we can deliberate, we can do it individually, but that's my recommendation. Someone else has other, you know, thoughts on the matter. We can certainly discuss. I mean, I, I have, I'm not, I'm just one person on the board here. So, uh, Maria. Uh, I think those sound great, but if someone else wants to be clerk, my term is up next year. So if someone else wants to step up and, and raise in the ranks, um, I'm happy to not be clerk as well, but I, I, I agree. I support Doug as chair and um, Tom Long as vice chair. Love that. Okay, good, good, Johanna. What, um, Andrew, Janet. So you'd need to nominate and then have a vote on each one. Okay. Someone would need to nominate. All right, so I, I, nom I nominate Doug. Uh, is there a second? Doug for uh, chair. 
Yeah. Second. Okay. And any discussion? No. Oh, Andrew. Does Doug want to be chair? <laughs> yeah. Good question. <laughs> Andrew, I, I can say this was not on my bucket list. <laughs> I, it's more that I'm willing rather than that I want. Mm -hmm. So happy, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite willing to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Any other further discussion on, on Doug for, for chair? I see none, let's do a roll call, Maria. Yes. Okay, Andrew. Aye. Doug. I probably should abstain. Okay, <laughs> Tom. Yes. Janet. Aye. Uh, and Johanna. Yes. And I'm an I too. So that's uh, six with um, one abstaining. And did Tom, uh, did pardon Tom me. Vote? Did Tom vote? Tom. Yes. Voted. He was. He was yes. yes. Right. And um, then I'd like to nominate Tom Long as the vice chair. Uh, Andrew? Um, I will be seconding, but just real quick before that, do we have any new members coming on the board? Or is anybody, anybody termed? I think, no, I think that board. Maria and I are, are, are at the end of our uh, appointment next summer. OK. Yeah, so we're all solid for the next year. And I guess with, with regard to you. Andrew, uh, Janet and I were the newly appointed members this for this new term. Andrew? I, did I say Andrew? It was Janet yeah. and me. Janet and, and I, I, yeah. Janet and yeah. I were, the, were newly appointed. Very good. Thanks. <clears throat> um, and, and I'll, with, I'll second the motion. Okay. And then discussion, uh, I'd like to as Andrew asked Tom, do you want to be vice chair? Are you good with that? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. I've seen okay. the burden put on Doug Marshall over the last <laughs> year, that, that incident when he may have had to run a meeting. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take that role. Okay. So any other discussion on the nomination for Tom as vice chair? I see none. Okay, let's do a roll call, Maria. Aye. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Abstain. Okay, Janet? Aye. Uh, Johanna? Aye. And I'm an I as well. And uh, Maria offered up the clerk. I don't know that the clerk, um, what are the duties of the clerk, Maria? To show up. <laughs> 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 the thing is, we have Pam that takes all the pressure off the clerk, basically, correct? I think my term is coming up. Back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, does anyone have a burning desire to be clerk? And, and, and do, we, do we need to have that position if, it's, if it doesn't really do anything? Can we just leave it unfilled or... Is it a requirement? It just, it doesn't it's seem like, like. Yeah. Chris, what do you say? I'd say you need it because if um, the chair and the vice chair are not available, the clerk would step in and chair the meeting. Could That's anybody, the way but, the rules and regulations read. Oh. Well, you know, no, no one's going to nominate themselves, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, of this no, group, anyway. If because... no one steps up, I'm happy to do it again. My, my, <laughs> my, my very tasking of, of, of being I chair. Nominate, uh, sorry, I nominate Maria again. Okay. And I'll second. All right. Uh, any discussion? I see none. Okay, let's do roll call. Maria? I'll abstain. All right. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Uh, Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I am an I as well. So that's that. And then we have our planning board committee position. position sorry. Um, I'm at the Pioneer, Pioneer, excuse me, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. 
Um, you know, I'd like to I'd like to stay on there. I'm on the executive committee. Um, I've been to every meeting. Um, so that's that. I don't. I guess since I won it, I'll nominate myself. <laughs> Next Andrew. Okay. I'll second Andrew. that. All right, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Do we have to, we're doing this the right way, right? We just we got to do one by one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes. Um, any discussion? No. Nope. Okay, take a roll call, Maria. Hi. Andrew. Hi. Doug. Hi. Tom. Hi. Janet. Hi. Johanna. Aye. And even though I nominated myself, <laughs> I'll abstain. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so the CPA committee, we have Andrew. Um, certainly, if you, I know your schedule is different. It's, yeah, I, I, I think same as uh, what Maria had said. If there's anybody who has interest in, in this, I I can step aside. I enjoyed it. It was sort of a, a big push um, kind of from now until January. And then you're pretty slow for most of the rest of the year. If people wanted to know that, but it is one, I think, I think a, a very exciting part of, of this is that your work is very tangible, right? Yeah. You see the park that just opened downtown. It's, um, it's a way to have a really positive direct in, impact on things that are happening in the community. So that said, happy to do it if uh, unless someone has a strong desire to. So you, I, nom I nominate Andrew. Okay, he, he's trying to wiggle out of it. I know. Oh, it's so. fun. I can see. <laughs> you want, you like want it. I. You want <laughs> I. All right. Is there uh, is there a second for Andrew? I'll second. I'll, I'll, yeah. All right, Doug. Doug. All right. Doug, Any discussion? Yeah, I was going to ask. Can I ask Andrew? Uh, you know. You had said you would do this last year because you weren't traveling very much. Uh, and I, I get the sense that has ramped back up. Are you confident you can contribute to that group? Um, probably, yes. So the there, I, I would say so. I mean, there'll be calls probably from the train. I don't know how that one went when I was on the last time, whether you found it was workable or not, but um, I'm, I'm certainly hopeful to be able to make all of them. Okay, that's that's good. Uh, any other discussion? Regard to Andrew and CPA. Okay, let's do a roll call then. Uh, Maria. Hi. Andrew or yeah, Andrew. No, I, I mean abstain. All right, Doug. Hi. Tom. You skipped Tom. Yeah. Oh, I, I did said Tom. Tom. I said I. Oh, okay. So uh, Janet. <laughs> I. In, okay. Uh, Joanna. I. And I'm an I. So that's six zero one. And the ad commission, Doug. Um, you know, I mean, it's dormant, so I'm fine with being the designated appointee for when it resumes, assuming it does. Yeah. Yeah, sounds doable. Um, so, all right. So uh, I'll nominate Doug. Second. All right, Tom, Andrew. And you know, I was just going to ask if anybody who wasn't on a committee wanted to to get on one, especially since it's so demanding. Uh, I know we've got a motion on the floor, but just <laughs> throwing it out there. <laughs> Doug's, Doug's going to be uh, running the show here. It's, uh, I know it's time, time consuming. Yeah, I'm, I'm, well, I'm happy to step aside. <laughs> oh, all right. Uh, so without other discussion, let's do roll call. Um, Doug for Ag Commission, Maria? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Abstain. Tom? Aye. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And myself is an aye, so that's 601. The next is the Design Review Board. Um, Tom Long is our current rep. 
I would nominate him again. I second. All right, any discussion? Tom, are you okay with that? Fine with me. Okay, good, good. So let's get into it. Uh, roll call here, Maria. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Doug. Aye. Tom. Same. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And myself as an aye. So another 601 for Tom as our design review board rep. And then, the, okay, and then that's it. So, um, you know, report to the chair. I'm, you know, uh, I thank you all. I think we've done a lot over this last year and um, we get another year together and uh, look forward to it. It should be very interesting. Uh, report to staff. Thank you for all the work you're doing and thank you for putting up with having so many meetings. I really appreciate it. Yeah, actually I forgot about uh, any liaison reports. Um, in the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, the executive committee met and all oh, we did is approve money, you know, basically uh, nothing earth shattering. Uh, CPA, what's going on there, Andrew? We, I can't remember if I gave this update or not. We had a meeting in August, I think, with just the kickoff and sort of setting up some of the ground rules and um, not a not a ton to report. I unfortunately was only able to stay for part of the call. Uh -huh. Okay, and then Ad Commission is dormant, right? Uh, Design Review Board, you're meeting next Tuesday, right? Okay. No, nothing new to report. Okay. And the, the CRC, you, you've kind of served up a little bit already. Yeah, so there. we mostly talked about um, the first hour was really taken up with the comprehensive housing policy. And the CRC is recommending the comprehensive housing policy. Um, the first part of it is the actual policy. And then the, there are three um, appendices. And I don't think I can recall what they are right now. But if you stop um, like on page eight and then the next three things are the appendices. So you can take a look at that in the CRC packet. So they are recommending that um, comprehensive housing policy to town council for um, a vote to adopt it. And um, the three appendices are going to be referred or the hope is that they will be referred to the CRC and the town manager for implementation. So the first part sets forth the policy and the second three things set yeah. forth the implementation. Yeah, John Hornick and, and Nate Malloy have done really a great job mm -hmm. yep. setting that out. And, um, and then the second part of the CRC meeting was all about um, apartments. And as I said, we had a lot, a lot of discussion about that. I think we talked about it for at least an hour. And the end result was to um, not uh, propose lifting the cap on the number of units in apartment buildings in the BG district. And it's, as I said, that's really a kind of a holding pattern, um, hoping that um, another solution can be developed in the future, but they didn't wanna hold up the apartments zoning amendment in order to have that um, taken care of. So that's what we'll be bringing to you on the 28th. Okay, thank you. And your report of staff? And my report of staff was to thank everybody for- Okay. <laughs> um, Jack, thank you for all your work. It's been, you've done a ton of work in a super busy year, so. Well, no, I mean, I've done, I know there's so many people on here have been doing a lot, a lot more than I have, that's for sure. But uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Well, it's hard uh, to, you've done, you've done a good job. Yeah. Handling handling unruly people in every area. Thank you, sir. But I think there's more unruly. That's I think we ha we've had decorum here, which I, I really appreciate. You know, in in Amherst here, so um, with a lot of differing opinions. The um, top, and the Zoom, the crazy Zoom thing. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. Uh, it, Christine used to say that we had planning board light you know, leading up to, you know, when she stepped down and watch out, Jack, you know, it's not, 
<laughs> it's gonna be a lot more heavy lifting and it certainly is, uh, it's given all of us a run for our money, but I think hopefully, you know, good work has become of it. So with that, I think we can adjourn. I did, I, I think I skipped over sections, but old business, new business, uh, Nothing and and our, we can just punt on that stuff, I hope. Okay. All right. I just wanted to get to that, you know, nominating Doug. I jumped a couple of sections. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what your hurry was, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jack. You did a great job with that here. Thank Not you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, is, is Doug's effective immediately? Or do you have like a swan song uh, that, I, that I the public can be aware of? I mean, Doug, I mean, I, yeah, I, I would think you'd be ready to hit the ground running. So, um, yeah, it'll be Doug next meeting. All so, right, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. All right. See good you night. soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.